Hello, my name is Anthony Effinger. I'm the host of the Think Neuro podcast. And today I'm talking with Dr. Barbara Geiser. She's a neurologist who specializes in the treatment of people with multiple sclerosis. Dr. Geiser, thank you for joining us. I'm pleased to be here, thank you. So I'm gonna need a, uh, a multiple sclerosis 101, if you would. Multiple sclerosis is actually the second most common cause of neurologic disability among young people. It's sort of an ageist, sexist, and racist disease, meaning that the stereotypical person with multiple sclerosis is a young Caucasian woman, most common onset, uh, age of onset is somebody in their 20s or 30s. MS is a disease where the immune system goes rogue. The immune system, which normally protects us and defends our body from outside uh, entities, uh, gets the wrong message and thinks that some part of the body is a foreign entity and does what it's supposed to do, which is attack it. In MS, uh, certain white blood cells and immune proteins that normally stay in the blood and don't get into the nervous system gain the ability to get into the nervous system and they start damaging the nerves in the brain, spinal cord, and optic nerve. That's what we define as the central nervous system. Um, the coating, the insulation on the nerves called myelin is attacked, and that's why we refer to this as a demyelinating condition. The wire or the axon of the nerve can be damaged as well. And when this happens, a nerve, which is basically just an electrical cable that transmits electrical and chemical signals, loses the ability to conduct these electrical signals in an efficient and coordinated manner, and that results in symptoms. So if a nerve isn't contacting a muscle properly, you may have weakness. If an optic nerve is damaged, there can be visual problems. If sensory impulses are not conducted uh, appropriately, you can have numbness or tingling or prickling or other sensory symptoms. Uh, there may be problems with thinking or memory or um, other functions as well. And that's why they call it multiple sclerosis, because it hits multiple parts of the nervous system. I was going to ask that. What is it that changes that allows these white blood cells to get at the nerves? Well, the 64 literally million dollar question in MS is what triggers this process? We don't know exactly what causes the immune system to go rogue. Most people think it's a combination of a genetic predisposition and some environmental influence. We have identified some environmental uh, contributing factors. Um, one is uh, being overweight early in life. One is having low vitamin D levels early in life. We know that smoking is a risk factor for developing MS. And again, as I said, this is a sexist disease, so one of the strongest genetic factors for getting MS is having two X chromosomes, being female. But um, there are a lot of uh, other um, influences that probably bear on this as well that we just haven't figured out. What is the incidence um, in women versus men? It's almost three times as common in women as men. Uh, this is the case, most autoimmune diseases are more common in women than men. And do we have any idea why that is? Um, it's not clear. Um, uh, teleologically, some people think that maybe it was important for women to have stronger immune systems and fight off infections so they would be able to uh, 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 rear and bear children. Uh, but that's just a theory. That's a theory at this yeah. point. Okay. So what about the age skewing? Is it, how, pro how much more prevalent is it in young um, again, most people uh, who have MS, the onset is roughly between ages 20 and 30. Approximately 10% of the MS population will have their onset before age 18. So that's technically referred to as pediatric MS. And um, it's a little bit of a bell-shaped curve. So you certainly do have people who present uh, older in, in their 50s and 60s. But uh, most commonly, it's a disease of young adults. And, and what about the, you said it's mostly Caucasians? Um, it's more common in people who are Caucasian. It's more common in people who have uh, some Northern European ancestry, although we certainly see it in African Americans and uh, uh, Asians and um, people who are Latinx. Okay. And did you, uh, is there, is that mean that it's more common in, say, the Northern Hemisphere? So that's a very good point. So uh, in the 20th century, there uh, we started to get some very interesting epidemiologic data. 
And it was noted that there's kind of a geographic gradient, that MS was much more prevalent in northern latitudes, places that were farther away from the equator, and it was uh, less prevalent uh, the more tropical the latitude was. And it turns out that one of the reasons for this probably has to do with vitamin D. As we've said, we know that low vitamin D levels earlier in life seem to be a, a risk factor for developing MS. In northern climates, there's less sunlight and there's weaker sunlight, and sunlight is one of the things that helps our bodies make vitamin D. So somebody who grew up in a cold climate might have lower vitamin D levels because of less sunlight exposure. Okay, but to this point, this is all, this is all, um, nothing has helped us pinpoint a precise cause of any. Again, we think the cause is probably multifactorial. We, we don't have one single factor. What, so what is the prevalence so, of MS over time? So right now it's estimated that there are uh, about a million people in the United States who currently carry a diagnosis of MS and perhaps uh, about two and a half million people worldwide. Okay, so it's, that's, that's common. It's, it's not an uncommon disease. As I say, after disability, it's the second most common cause. A after trauma, it's the second most common cause of neurologic disability among young people. After so trauma like concussion or, or some damage, some, some physical, physical damage to the yes. okay. So it's number two in that it's regard. Number two neurologic cause. Yeah. yeah. So what, tell me about when patients come to you, often young patients. Um, what what are they presenting with? So the, the initial symptoms of MS can be uh, very varied, and um, most of them can certainly be caused by other things. So one common scenario might be a young woman who comes to her doctor and says, you know, I'm just really tired, and I haven't really changed my usual routine. I'm busy, but I'm just too tired to move. And because obviously many, many, many things can cause fatigue, um, MS certainly might not be the first thing you would think of. Other common symptoms that might have other etiologies would be sensory symptoms, numbness or tingling. And for example, people might have numbness in their hands and think perhaps they have carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, sometimes people can present with um, changes in their bladder habits, having to go to the bathroom a lot or not being able to wait. Again, obviously MS is not the only thing that can cause that. So um, there might be MS symptoms that could have a number of other causes. And um, sometimes you have to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Yeah, so this is, is it, relatively speaking, is it, it, it sounds like it's, it can be a tricky diagnosis. Sometimes it's, it's a tricky diagnosis. Uh, we're very fortunate for the past uh, over 30 years, we've had access to MRI imaging, which was a great advance in diagnosing MS because it allows us to look at the brain and spinal cord in living people and actually see the areas of nerve damage. Uh, before that, imaging techniques just weren't sensitive enough. And about 100 years ago, the diagnostic test that we had for MS was called the hot bath test. We've said that the nerves in MS are damaged and they're not conducting electricity efficiently. And if you heat up a damaged nerve, it causes further conduction problems. So somebody figured out that if you put somebody who might have MS in a tub of hot water and raise their body temperature and they develop neurologic symptoms, it was taken as putative evidence of multiple sclerosis. That is fascinating. So right now- That was how long ago? About, about 100 years ago. That's really. some pretty, um, that's some amazing thinking and very resourceful. Yeah, well, um, uh, back, back then, uh, a lot of medical work relied less on tests because we didn't have them and more on clinical um, acumen. And even today, um, the first and I think the most important part of diagnosing somebody with MS or not diagnosing them is to do a very thorough history and physical exam. That's where it all starts. How long, so tell me about the, uh, the history. How long, how long, how much time do you spend with somebody to, to get this history? Well, as I say, the, the, I think the most important part of the visit is to really get a good history and, and try to, to uh, elicit historical information that may clue you in that this may or may not be MS. And then, of course, we look for any findings on neurologic exam to substantiate them. So when I first meet somebody, I'm going to spend most of my first visit trying to get that information and trying to see if I think MS is in the differential diagnosis. 
Um, if I think that there's a good chance the person may have MS, I will uh, proceed with MRI imaging. The other ways that we can diagnose MS is sometimes we can do spinal taps. We can look for the presence of certain uh, immune proteins that about 90% of people who have MS have in their spinal fluid. Um, we may do some blood tests not to look for MS because currently there is no blood test to diagnose MS, but there are other conditions that may mimic MS and we'd want to rule those out so we can do some blood tests for that. And then um, lastly, if we think that the person may have MS, but we can't uh, find sufficient evidence of nerve damage on an MRI or on the other tests, we may do electrical tests called evoke potentials. What is that? So again, uh, we're using the analogy that nerves are basically electrical cables and they're conducting electricity. And um, when a nerve uh, has a response to something, either a visual stimulus or um, an auditory stimulus, it will produce a waveform that we can measure the timing of. If there's damage along the nerves, the timing will be delayed. So we can do these tests called evoke potentials, which measure the brain's response to certain selected stimuli. And if the timing is delayed, that may be evidence of damage along those pathways. The nice thing about evoke potentials is they're harmless and painless. And sometimes they can tell us that there's nerve damage that we can't see on an MRI or that hasn't yet produced a symptom. So they're not specific tests, but they're very sensitive tests. That makes sense. What sort of questions are you asking when you meet a patient? What are the questions you ask to elicit this information that might lead you to these other tests? So generally somebody will come to see me uh, because they've had some symptoms that uh, somebody uh, has suggested may be MS or sometimes I see people that have already been diagnosed with MS and they want a second opinion. But usually the history we will elicit are um, Again, some of the symptoms I've mentioned, sensory symptoms, fatigue, weakness, trouble with balance, possibly uh, urinary symptoms. And the most common form of MS is what we call the relapsing remitting form, which means the typical pattern is that these symptoms come and go. Mm, that's tricky. Um, about 85% of people who have MS have this relapsing remitting form, and it's one of the more characteristic features of, of the disease. What, what causes that? Um, it's a great question. Is it, is it one of those things that... Well, we think what happens during an acute attack or an acute exacerbation, or some of my patients like to call it an acute exasperation, <laughs> is that there's acute inflammation going on in the nervous system. And so when the nervous system, when the immune system is active, when it's uh, uh, in an acute attack mode against the uh, nervous system, there's inflammation. And that's most likely what contributes to a flare up. If you uh, do an MRI of somebody during an exacerbation, you're more likely to see inflammation on the MRI. Does that mean that um, people with MS are um, likely to struggle more with, with flus and things like that? Well, so, and again, uh, one, one way of looking at it is that the immune system is kind of in overdrive. It's sort of active when it shouldn't be, and it's active against a target it shouldn't be attacking. So um, just anecdotally, what I often hear from my patients is that they tend not to get colds and not to get sick because they have this overactive immune system. Do you find that people are, do you find that people are reluctant to go in and explore whether or not they have MS? Do you get any of that? sort of diagnosis um, avoidance with um, this? Well, it, it people, when when they've been told they might have MS or, or, or they're told they do have MS, it can be very scary. Um, and the initial reaction of a lot of people is, oh my God, I have this disease and it's incurable. And what I've sometimes said is, well, there's kind of a cliche that the only thing a doctor can really cure is pregnancy and a broken leg. <laughs> so for most diseases in medicine, we don't cure them. We don't make them go away, but we treat them. And the good news about MS is that it's an eminently treatable and controllable condition. Let's talk about that because I've known people, uh, you know, in my lifetime who've had MS for as, you know, as long as I've known them and they seem to do very well. How, how, why are they doing well? Um, so over the last uh, almost 30 years, we've had a category of medications called disease-modifying therapies. And these are medications that actually interfere with the immune system's ability to attack the nerves. So they're very effective in, in reducing relapses and reducing inflammation and further damage. Some of our newer agents also are effective against the more progressive forms of the disease, and they help to slow progression down as well. So I think people are doing well with MS these days, most of them 
uh, because we have these very effective medications, because we're able to diagnose earlier and we're able to intervene earlier. And also, very importantly, we're able to um, advise people on lifestyle practices that we know have an influence on uh, how well they're going to feel and function. But what are those? So we know, for example, that um, exercise is very important in helping anybody feel and function their seems, best. Yeah, it seems like exercise is the answer to it, it, it's, a I, lot I, of things. I tell my patients it's kind of the magic bullet for a lot of things. But um, certainly in animal models, um, and, and there are animal models, you can give mice and rodents a disease that looks very much like MS. So in the animal models, when the uh, mice are exercised or, or put on an exercise wheel, uh, the mouse MS is not as severe. We certainly know know from human studies that exercise can be anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. It has been shown to lower some inflammatory proteins and certain symptomatically in studies of people with MS, exercise has been shown to improve many symptoms such as fatigue, mood, uh, spasticity, which is muscle tightness. Certain forms of exercise may be beneficial in improving muscle weakness. So it's just good. <laughs> Do we have any idea why it's good or are we just, we're going with this? Um, uh, again, I think there, there are a number of reasons. Certainly cardiovascular conditioning is important. It helps fatigue. It helps build up endurance. Um, it's not quite clear what the, what the anti-inflammatory mechanisms are. Again, certainly in animal models, there's some data that exercise may actually increase neural connections. So I don't think we have all the whys worked out, but we certainly know that, but it is good for you. you know the, yeah, we know the result. What about diet? So diet is an area that's very interesting and very hot in MS right now because we're just beginning to uh, be able to make some evidence-based recommendations. Up until fairly recently, most of the um, claims for diet were anecdotal, meaning they hadn't been subjected to rigorous uh, scientific trials. But we're starting to get some evidence-based recommendations. Um, we know that, for example, uh, not only for MS but for other diseases, saturated fat is not a good thing. It tends to be pro-inflammatory. Um, there are uh, a little bit of data, it's certainly not conclusive for the MS population, but there are a little bit of data that salt may not be a good thing. Uh, we know that when we look at um, people's diet quality and quality of life, that there tends to be a correlation. So there have been some studies where they looked at people with MS who had, quote, poor diets, what we call the Western diet, which is a lot of fat, a lot of refined sugars, as opposed to mm -hmm. a healthier diet, which was plant heavy and lean protein um, and whole grains. And the people who had the healthier diet had a better quality of life. So... Um, there's no data that any one specific diet is um, curative for MS, and there's no data that any one specific diet has disease-modifying properties. But we do know that healthier eating tends to be associated with better function and better quality of life. Also, we know that healthier diets um, are good for what we call vascular comorbidities. So we know that people who have high blood pressure or diabetes or high cholesterol uh, if they have MS, they tend to do worse neurologically than people with MS without the comorbidities. So obviously a healthier diet will benefit these comorbidities as well and then indirectly produce a better neurologic outcome. So eat well and exercise. That's it, just what your grandma told you. Yeah. It seems like this might be, this is one of these diseases, it's, it's a disease of sort of our Western affluent lifestyle of well, you know, these it, fat, lots of fats, lots of sugars, um, sedentary... Again, I think that that, that Western lifestyle probably uh, is not beneficial uh, for anybody, and it certainly it's not beneficial for somebody who already has a diagnosis. Not 100% clear how those things factor as risk factors. They might, but that data is, is a little bit less robust. Although, again, low vitamin D levels, obesity, smoking, those um, we have a little more epidemiologic data that, that those appear to be risk factors. And now a message from our sponsor. The Think Neuro podcast is brought to you by Pacific Neuroscience Institute Foundation, a nonprofit 501c3 organization. If you're inspired by what you hear and wish to support our mission of education through innovation, please visit pacificneuro.org slash foundation. So how, what can somebody with a diagnosis of MS expect um, the next, you know, 20 years to look like? Well, 
what I, what I tell people right now is there's certainly no good time to be diagnosed with MS, but if you have to have that diagnosis, now is the best time. Because again, we have very highly effective treatments to help prevent future damage. We're starting to get data about making lifestyle recommendations that can go hand in hand with medical treatment. We're getting better at diagnostics and we're developing new medications all the time. So what I like to tell my newly diagnosed patients are, I don't have a guarantee and I don't have a crystal ball, but with appropriate treatment and appropriate lifestyle and maybe a little bit of luck, I anticipate that their MS is going to be more of a nuisance than anything that seriously disables them. That's my goal. That, that's a fabulous goal. I hate to be morbid, but what is the life expectancy? Is, it, is this the kind of thing that you live with? Yes. Or you yes. die with? Yes. So, so most people, the vast majority of people with MS will have a normal lifespan. Okay, and that's not going to be what what kills them. It's going to be something else for for most people. For most yes. people, okay. Yes. yes. So this sounds like it's it's there's a lot you can do. There is absolutely, and there's a lot, lot you that do. you can uh, enjoy, and 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 there's lots of. This is not in any means a terrible. Um, this this is certainly, uh, as we said, this is certainly not a fatal disease. This is not. This is not inevitably a progressive disease. It's not in, not even inevitably a progressive disease. Not inevitably. Okay. Um, and uh, again, as we get better at diagnosing and treating it, we are able to certainly extend um, a full functional quality of life for um, many people. What is the go-to drug or drugs these days? So when we talk about medications for people with MS, we like to break it down into two categories. One are these disease modifying therapies that I just spoke about. These are the drugs that help prevent future nerve damage by interfering with the immune system's ability to attack the nerves. And right now, as of this morning, I think there are 18 FDA approved agents. Um, we're getting more all the time. What are some of those names? I'm and, just um, so there are older medications. The first disease modifying agent was introduced in 1993. So again, we have almost 20, uh, almost 30 years experience with this. Uh, that drug was a uh, compound, uh, the generic would be called beta interferon. Um, mm. So we have our older drugs, which are injectables, which are beta interferon and glutiramir. Um, about 10 years ago, we got the first oral medication. So we have several oral medications. We have IV medications that people take once a month or a few times a year. Um, and we're developing um, new uh, infusibles and oral medications all the time. So these are these disease modifying therapies. They help prevent future nerve damage, but they don't treat symptoms and they don't make people feel better. So we have a whole other category of medications and strategies that symptom management. And this is generally a combination of specific medications for symptoms. And so some symptoms we might treat might be fatigue or muscle tightness, spasticity, or bladder and bowel symptoms, um, or um, pain. So these are symptoms we can treat with a combination of medication. There are a number of medications we could give for muscle tightness. A common one is called baclofen. Mm. Sometimes we use Valium-like medications in small doses to treat spasticity. We have medications we use to treat pain or sensory symptoms. We have medications we use to treat fatigue. And then coupled with this, um, and especially if somebody has had an acute exacerbation, for example, and um, they're walking maybe under par, we very commonly rely on our colleagues in rehabilitation. So physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, um, so uh, assistive devices, assistive modalities. So we use a combination of things to treat symptoms and then we try to couple all this medical management with these healthy lifestyle practices. So um, I've sometimes said to patients, Multiple sclerosis is a very apt name for this disease. It affects multiple parts of the nervous system. It affects multiple functions that people uh, want to do. It can affect uh, multiple people in a family. And we have to come at it from multiple angles. Hmm. These exacerbations, that's the word you used, how long do those tend to last? Or is that totally individual? So yes, to all of the yeah. above. So generally an exacerbation may last several days or several weeks, um, and then uh, it will remit, meaning most of the symptoms will die down and the patient uh, might go 
a long time. So what's what's uh, somewhat more unpredictable is uh, the time between exacerbations. And again, that's one of the things that our disease modifying therapies do, which is they greatly prolong the time between attacks. They also tend to reduce the severity of the attacks. And during uh, non-exacerbated times, are you feeling pretty normal? So um, people uh, certainly will tend to feel better than when they're in the middle of an acute attack, but it doesn't mean that they're symptom-free. So um, people may still continue to have symptoms. And what's sometimes hard for uh, people to appreciate is they may have a symptom, they may wake up one day feeling more tired or more numb or maybe having some trouble with their vision, but it goes away by the next day. So we actually have a formal definition of an exacerbation, which is that it has to be either the appearance of a new symptom or the reoccurrence of a previous symptom that has to last at least 24 to 48 hours. What we also know is that people with MS can sometimes have what are referred to as pseudo exacerbations, which is an unfortunate term. It doesn't mean that it's not real, it's absolutely real. But what it means is that the uh, heightened symptoms, the attack, was caused by a known precipitant. And most commonly, this would be either an infection or getting overheated, either um, going in a hot tub or a sauna or having a fever. And generally, when that happens, if you cool the person down, the symptoms tend to remit. And this goes back to what we were talking about before, when about how nerves tend to not function as well when they're at greater temperatures. Exactly. That's exactly Healthy right. nerves. That's exactly right. So if you've right. got MS, you're acutely sensitive to yes. this. Yes. Yes. Okay. So do you advise people with MS to avoid that, that's hot tubs? One, and that's actually one of the few lifestyle recommendations we, we do uh, tend to suggest, which is to avoid hot tubs and saunas. And um, if you're going to go swimming, swimming is a great exercise, but try to do it in a pool that's not warmer than about 85 degrees or so. Yeah, well, the, all the pools I've ever been in are cold. So when you get in there, you're... You, yeah. yeah. Well, the nice thing about swimming is that it has benefits for people with MS on a number of levels. It's great cardiovascular exercise. If people are weak, if they can't do something on land, they may be able to do it in the water because they're not fighting gravity. And because the water dissipates body heat, you can't get overheated. Yeah, that's so, a great... So yeah. swimming hits a, ticks a number of boxes. It, t- it ticks a number of boxes for many... Uh, okay, diseases. Yeah. It's a, it's a good one. When somebody comes to PNI, what what are you, what are you uniquely able to to provide here? So, um, uh, my expertise lies in, in having specialized in MS for almost forty years. So, um, I like to think that I can give people the benefit of my experience, not only in diagnosing but in knowing how to manage their disease, how to partner with them to help them live their best lives with MS, and to be um, au courant on what the most recent research findings are. Yeah. What, um, how, did you, how did you come to be involved um, in, with MS? So um, I've often told my students that I think sometimes careers find you. Um, I trained, uh, I did my neurology residency at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York City, and that was the site of one of the very first MS comprehensive care centers there. It was established by a man named Dr. Leib Scheinberg, who was one of the great men of MS of the 20th century. And I had rotated through his clinic when I was a resident, and uh, I guess he liked me because I'd managed not to kill any of his patients. (laughs) So when I graduated my residency, he offered me a job, and I wasn't particularly interested in MS, but I needed a job, and I thought, well, I'll do this for a year or two until something better comes along. And... um, (laughs) We just were a good fit for each other. And your residency was in neurology. Neurology. So you were already down the neurology. Road. Yes, I'd already. And then you okay, okay. So what did MS treatment look like then? So the the great genius of Dr. Scheinberg, and again, this was back in the early '80s, was that at a time when the conventional wisdom for MS was, well, you have MS, I can't do anything. Go home and you know call me if if you need a wheelchair. The the great genius of Dr. Scheinberg was to say, no, we can help these people lead full and functional lives. So he prescribed rehabilitation. He encouraged them to exercise. He encouraged them to have children, which was a radical thing because, again, the conventional wisdom was people with MS shouldn't have children because everybody just knew that that pregnancy was bad for MS. And it turns out that not only is pregnancy not bad for women with MS, but it turns out to be a very good thing. So really? what we've learned over the past 
20 odd years or so is that uh, in any woman who is pregnant, the immune system is dialed down. And that's because when um, a woman, uh, when a baby is developing inside a woman, half of its proteins come from the father and they would normally be viewed as foreign proteins. And in any woman, if, if the immune system were not dialed down, the uh, immune system would attack the baby. We'd never be able to reproduce. Makes sense. So, so mother nature is very cleverly engineered so that in any woman during pregnancy, the immune system is dialed down and we're able to bear children in women with MS for this reason, when their immune system is, is modulated by the pregnancy, it's actually very good for them. So do they feel, they feel so symptom free or most, m- much less? So, so it's been documented that the exacerbation rate goes way down during pregnancy and um, most people are pretty symptom free, although there are some symptoms of pregnancy, which are fatigue and later on in the pregnancy difficulty walking just because of the weight that can overlap with symptoms of it. Certainly. Is there any way you could mimic the mimic pregnancy in the body? Like So that's a great question. So there is a researcher at UCLA, Dr. Rhonda Voskel, who's done the most work in this. And she has conducted some trials giving women a pregnancy hormone, which is called estriol. So all women make estrogens, only make estrogens at different time of the month. But during pregnancy, we make a specific estrogen called estriol, which is only produced during pregnancy. And Dr. Voskel did a trial giving this as an add-on therapy to uh, about 100 20 women with MS. Uh, All of them took a conventional MS disease modifying therapy. And then in addition to that, half the woman got estriol and half the woman got a placebo hormone. And she was able to demonstrate that there was a decreased relapse rate uh, in the women who took the estriol and the conventional therapy. Interesting. So um, it's a uh, fairly small study. Um, it hasn't been replicated yet, but I think there's further research going is on. It, is that fairly area. recent? Uh, that study was published in 2012, I think. Interesting. So that's that's new, and that's it's um it's an interesting line of research. So coming back, your your mentor. Tell me his name again. His name was Dr. Leib Scheinberg. So Dr. Scheinberg, I think that's why some people have an impression of this disease as being you know, terrible, because before he came along, I mean, the 80s, I remember, it was like, oh my gosh, MS, it's like this. But well, he was responsible he, for this. He, he, was one of, he was one of the main uh, MS specialists at that time who was responsible, as I say, for, for um, encouraging people to live their lives, to be active, to have children, to exercise. Uh, I mean, back then, the other part of the conventional wisdom was people were MS were told, don't exercise and don't do anything. And what I tell my patients now is that if we could have picked the one single most worst thing to oh. tell them, that probably was it. Um, and again, it was sort of like the pregnancy thing. There weren't any data. It was just, well, everybody knows this so, because they say. So that's why it's also that's important to have, to have evidence-based recommendations. But, but anyway, so uh, Dr. Scheinberg used rehab. He used um, a team approach. And that's the, the other important part, I think, of treating people with multiple sclerosis. Uh, to, to quote uh, Secretary Clinton, it does take a village. And so uh, ideally, people with MS have access to not only neurologists, but um, nurses with expertise in MS and nurse practitioners and rehabilitative specialists and psychologists and other medical professionals that they may need, such as psychiatrists or urologists, um, it takes a team approach. That makes sense. What, what's, what are you most excited about research-wise? In the um, MS world right now. So um, we're always looking for new and, and better drugs, and there are a lot of them in development. One thing that I think is coming up on the horizon, hopefully in the next year or so, is a test that will help us be uh, more accurate at measuring response to drug and measuring disease progression. So I told you that we don't have a blood test from it, which is true. We don't have a diagnostic blood test. But there is a breakdown product when nerves get damaged called neurofilament light chains. And this uh, breakdown product is not specific for MS. It can occur when there's any damage to the nervous system, such as an injury or a stroke or something like that. But what people have found out is that you can get, um, you can measure levels of these neurofilament light chains in the blood of people with MS. And it appears to correlate with drug response, meaning that when people are treated with an appropriate disease modifying therapy, the level goes down. 
Um, it may also correlate with the possibility of developing worse disease. So it's another metric that we can measure to see which people may do well or may not do well. And it's another metric that we can help uh, see if people are responding to our medication. So, so this test isn't approved yet, but it, it's getting uh, close to being approved, I think. So that would let you dial the drug treatment in? Well, it may be another, right now, when uh, the, somebody is so duck, I'm, you know, taking these shots, or I'm taking these pills, how do I know if it's working? And we go back and we say, well, what is the drug supposed to do? The drug is supposed to decrease exacerbations. So we look at how many exacerbations you've had. It's supposed to decrease new scars and inflammation on the MRI. So we look at the MRI and we look overall to see if people are, you know, staying the same or getting worse. This blood test may be one other metric that we can use as a response to drug. Not, not the only metric, but part of the picture. Yeah. When you look at these MRI, MRIs of people with MS, do you see the damage? uniformly through the nerves nervous system or does it is it patchy does it how does it distribute so by by definition this is a disease that attacks multiple parts of the nervous system and we can image the brain we can image the spinal cord and um on most MRIs, the, the uh, areas of nerve damage in MS are referred to as plaques, mm. and they show up as discrete areas. They tend to favor some locations more than others, so it's not an entirely random process, but basically any part of the nervous system can be yes. affected. But the MRI is a reliable... Uh, you can look at an MRI and say, okay, so I'm seeing something that... Is most likely MS. So, yes. So okay. so certainly, um, again, when, when we look at an MRI, we're, we're looking at, at these plaques or spots, if you will. And there's um, literally a list of about 100 things that can cause spots on an MRI. So MS is not the only thing that can do this. But there are characteristics of MS lesions that tend to favor uh, an MS diagnosis as opposed to other things. And there are uh, imaging characteristics that uh, people are researching. So one thing that's... Um, very exciting in the MS imaging world right now is what's called the central vein sign, which is that an MS plaque uh, may have um, a vein running through it and this shows up as a small hole on the MRI, whereas an area of nerve damage, say from a migraine or from another cause, tends not to have this central vein sign. So oh, central vein sign, people are looking at this, tends to be more specific for MS. Um, MS uh, tends to, um, we very commonly find lesions uh, around an area of the brain called the periventricular area, which is kind of in the middle of the brain. And the lesions for MS tend to be oriented perpendicularly to this area. That's something that's more characteristic of an MS lesion than, say, a lesion from another cause. Here at PNI, the treatment approach to people with multiple sclerosis is very congruent with the whole PNI concept of brain health, which is using wellness strategies combined with state-of-the-art medical management to produce the best lives for people with neurologic disease. Yeah, so it's holistic. It, it's, it's more comprehensive. Comprehensive. Okay, and that's what, and again, that's when you can have a one-stop kind of shop. That's that's the goal. That's the goal. Brilliant. Dr. Geiser, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Anthony.